Well, welcome. Today we're giving you a presentation on nuclear power, Australia's secure energy and climate solution for a century. It's my pleasure to introduce Robert Parker. Robert Parker became president of the Australian Nuclear Association in 2014. He graduated as a civil engineer from the University of New South Wales, where he obtained a Master in Engineering Science and spent over 35 years in engineering design, project management and project development. Robert is very experienced. He's worked in Africa, Vietnam, Indonesia and the Middle East. Um, concerned with the need to limit Australia's carbon emissions, Rob recognised that no effective action could occur without the use of nuclear, nuclear energy. This led to the completion of a Master in Nuclear Science at the ANU. It's my pleasure to welcome Rob here today. Thank you for that introduction, Robert. And I'm pleased to let you all know today that we've got two people who are experts in their respective fields. This presentation could not happen without the intellectual endeavour of my colleague, Dr. Robert Barr, who's going to speak to you later about the economics of nuclear energy and why it's vital for our secure energy future. But I'll introduce you later on in Robert's in the, in the talk. Nuclear power is vital for Australia's secure energy and climate solution for a century. Today, we're going to basically look at four distinct sections. We're going to talk about who wants low cost, low carbon nuclear energy. Then Robert's going to outline the case, the economic case for, for the delivery of reliable energy to Australia in a low carbon world. Then I'll discuss what we could build and where and how long it would take. So who wants low cost, low carbon nuclear energy in Australia? Well, Compass Polling recently had a look. We're going to look at two particular <coughs> results of polls now. Compass Polling put to a group of about a thousand Australians that nuclear energy is used to generate electricity in advanced economies such as France, USA, China, Sweden, UK and Canada. And they outlined that its safety and reliability have improved considerably in the last 20 years. So the, the poll group said, do you think Australia should reconsider nuclear in our plan for a cleaner energy future meeting our Paris Agreement targets? To which 63% of the respondents said we should, 37% said no, that's almost a two to one. And that's a very resounding number to a question that admittedly is somewhat leading. If we go to a very balanced question, to what extent do you support or oppose Australia developing nuclear power plants for the generation of electricity? Essential polling found late last month that 50% of Australians supported that idea, 32% opposed and 18 were unsure. So on that basis, one can conclude that the majority of Australians are certainly in favour. And we are seeing daily in the media an increasing group of Australians calling for nuclear energy. We've seen it recently with interviews in the ABC. We've seen it on Sky Television. We see it regularly through uh, outlets such as Channel 9, Channel 7 or Sky TV. So it's definitely gaining a lot of momentum within the Australian population. So now we'll move on to why build nuclear energy. And this is where I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Robert Barr, in a minute, who will look at the economics and reliability of nuclear energy. We're fortunate to have Robert here today. Robert is consulting engineer and director of Electric Power Consulting. He's the past president of the Electric Energy Society of Australia. He's over 47 years experience in the field of electric power systems and is a fellow of the Engineers, of Engineers Australia and a member of Consult Australia. 
Robert is a past honorary professional fellow at the, Un <coughs> at the University of Wollongong and was Australian National Professional Electrical Engineer of the Year in 2012. Dr. Barr is a member of the Order of Australia for Surfaces to Engineering. That's no mean feat. So what we're getting now is a gentleman who is whose entire career is fully steeped in transmission and distribution. Dr. Barr is passionate about building a better power system for Australia and making internationally cost competitive, comparable to countries like the United States, Canada and Korea. So I'd like to hand you over now to Dr. Robert Barr. Thank you, Rob, for that introduction. Why build nuclear energy? For a dry climate, nuclear fission is the only proven means of achieving economically ultra-low carbon energy. Nuclear power can give us high levels of reliability, low cost electricity, low carbon emissions, and particularly for our regional areas, it can create wealth generation that can um, help our country for, for generations to come. Nuclear energy is the most sustainable use of non-renewable materials because of the high energy density output that nuclear can produce. Now I'm gonna talk about the electric power consulting model. We've got a model here that can, um, can look at a very, very wide range of uh, generation mixes. And we've been able to run these mixes through the model to get very good feel of uh, what's possible with nuclear, what's possible without nuclear. Just to uh, uh, show you here, the model works on the load of the national electricity market. What we did, we took uh, three years worth of data. We looked at the loading from the national electricity market. The thick black line here represents the total load on the system. It's the sum of all customer loads and is the load that needs to be supplied by all the generators. We looked at the output from solar farms. We looked at the output from wind farms. And so we were able to build into the model the variability that occurs in the renewable energy generators. We're also able to cover brown coal, black coal, combined cycle gas, hydro and open cycle gas. So it's a very comprehensive model the EPC model not only give us, gives us generated dispatch, but it also gives us costing information. It takes into account operating costs and capital costs of the various uh, generation components, as well as uh, transmission and uh, distribution. And it's able to give us very, very useful insights on what's possible in the national electricity market. In this particular example here, we're looking at the integrated system plan, fast change scenario. And we've gone to the very end of the plan, 2042. Now with these plans, I always like going to the end because the end shows us where the plan is leading us, where this is the, the goal of all the work that occurs between now and 2042 and it's showing where we want the plan to lead us to. So if we, if we went with the fast ISP plan, this is where we'd be in 2042. And what we're seeing here is the plan still retains some brown coal down the bottom, some black coal, some uh, combined cycle gas. So we still have some fossil fuels, but the really significant part is that we have a lot of uh, solar energy and the solar energy is uh, generating power well above the maximum demand of the national electricity market. This is from grid solar through here up until rooftop solar up here. And you can see above it all, we're getting um, this um, brown area here, which is renewable energy spillage. This, is, this represents energy that we can't utilize because of two, two reasons. Firstly, our energy storage could be already full. If it's all, if our energy, if our pump storage and our batteries are already full, we can't push any more energy into those uh, mediums. Or if there's not enough megawatt capacity to move the power around to where storage could be utilised. So 
what this does, the we're seeing renewable energy in the middle of the day, particularly with solar, pushing deep down into the brown coal here and the black coal here. So for coal-fired power stations, this is a very, very difficult scenario in which to operate. And then at, when the sun goes down toward the afternoon, we're seeing the energy that's stored, this part in here, this part of the, uh, of the yellow area here going into storage is taken out of storage and used to support the, uh, the, uh, the grid where we get the output from our pump storage. So that's how the 2042 fast change scenario looks like from AEMO. If we move forward to a more aggressive plan, if we look at the integrated system plan, fast scenario change, where we've got 21 gigawatts of pump storage, this is what the system looks like. Now, just, just to get a handle on how big 21 gigawatts of pump storage is, if we go to the Snowy 2.0 scheme, which has got two, uh, two gigawatts of, um, uh, of output, we're looking with this particular plan of over 10 Snowy 2.0 systems. This is a very, very large system with very with enormous levels of storage in it. Very, very difficult to put together. And you'll see that there's no there's no black coal, there's no brown coal. It's all renewable. We have hydro here. We've got wind. We've got solar here, solar grid, solar uh, rooftop, and we have our renewable spillage at the top. And you'll notice that the renewable spillage is now larger than it was with our, with our previous plan. So this is, a, this is what 100% renewable looks like. Now, part of the proposals that we've been hearing through the news is that um, maybe we can use this for hydrogen production. And I, I presume that the plan would be that we would utilise these renewable spillage areas here to make hydrogen. Now, the difficulty I see with this is that what we have to do is have hydrogen plants with connection to this spillage area, but they would only operate for sh such short periods. They'd operate for three or four hours during that day and then uh, uh, other longer for this particular day. And then there'd be days like this one over here where there'd be almost no energy available. So what you would have is a hydrogen plant sitting idle for many, many hours of the day, many, many days of the year. The alternative would be to put more and more storage into the system to make the hydrogen plant, to allow the hydrogen plant to operate on a 24-7 basis. And that would mean going even further beyond the 21 gigawatts of uh, storage, maybe 30 or even 40 gigawatts of storage, which is an enormous cost. And that's why we think that hydrogen production is problematic and very, very difficult to achieve economically. So what might the transmission system look like with a, as we move toward these renewable energy zones? Now, I've drawn a very simple system here just to illustrate the, the key points. If we take a look at New South Wales and, in, and the load around Sydney in particular, a lot of the load in New South Wales is concentrated in this Sydney area. And at the moment, there's um, a lot of uh, coal-fired power stations in the northern coal fields. These are uh, Araring, Liddell, uh, other uh, power stations up here. And we've got very strong connection from the, from the Hunter Valley through into Sydney. Now, a place like Dubbo out in the central west uh, is a relatively small load compared to Sydney. And there's a link out here, but it doesn't have to be a particularly strong link because the loads in Dubbo are not that particularly large. Then we've got Canberra down here toward the, the south. And Canberra is a um, uh, reasonable size Sid city, not quite as big as Sydney. And so we need a, a reasonable link through to Canberra. And we'll have another link down here into, the, into um, Snowy Hydro, where, where the Snowy 2.0 is being built at the moment. So that's... That's what we're looking at with transmission under the present arrangements. If we move to 100% renewable, 
a system that looks like this, what we end up doing is that we requiring a transmission system that looks more like this. So our coal-fired power stations have been closed down, so we run the risk of this part of the network uh, being underutilised, pro probably still being utilised but not being fully utilised. But if we put a lot of renewable generation out here at Dubbo, at a brand new renewable energy zone, what we have to do now is get enough capacity, transmission capacity between Dubbo and Sydney to supply basically all the load of Sydney for three, four, five hours of the day. And that's why I've put in these extra three lines here in, uh, that are shown in pink to uh, indicate the extra transmission capacity required to move power from Dubbo to Sydney in the middle of the day. But that's not enough. There's more generation to uh, to be utilised, and that's this this part here. This is the part between the the load here and this generation output here. This part here has to be moved into storage. And to get it into storage, what we have to do, we need transmission capacity from the renewable energy zone, Dubbo, down to Snowy 2.0, where it's going to be stored. So this was a transmission requirement that wasn't needed before, but is now needed under a 100% renewable scheme. Then we need more capacity because during this part of the day, where, we, where, where we're drawing down on the energy storage, this part here, we need capacity to move power from Snowy 2.0 through Canberra back into Sydney. And what's not understood with the renewable energy schemes is the very, very high cost of transmission. All this transmission has to be built. All of it has to be paid for. And we're seeing we're seeing this at the beginning now with um, HumeLink, which we which I understand has an estimate originally of one point three billion dollars, now blowing out to three point four billion, with the possibility of it even rising another forty percent, and that's that's to do that's related to this part of the system up through here, but it's not just high voltage transmission that's involved. When the renewable energy zone is built around Dubbo, we need a sub-transmission system. Because renewable energy is dispersed generation, we're going to end up with solar farms and wind farms that are spread over a very, very wide area around Dubbo. We're going to have to build a new sub-transmission system uh, around here, probably much more with much more capacity than the existing sub-transmission system that would be out there at the moment. So I want to stress that renewable energy zones and 100% renewable system has got very, very high transmission and sub-transmission costs. So let's have a look at what we could do with nuclear. Can we combine nuclear with high levels of variable renewables? Well, when we do the modelling, what we find here, with this is a scheme that's 50% renewable and 50% nuclear. Now, to get that level of mix to work, we've got our nuclear power coming up here, this bottom light blue area. Uh, we've got our hydro in the uh, dark blue area. And then we've got our solar working up here, doing what it did in the previous version. It's going up here above the level of the um, NEM load with this part here going into storage. So now the difficulty with this scheme now is to get enough renewable energy into the system to get the 50%, we're driving down through the hydro, which is fine because the hydro can back off and come forward as required. But the difficulty becomes when it pushes down into the nuclear space. And uh, what it's causing here is the nuclear energy to, to back off its power output and its load factor will reduce and it'll become problematic and more difficult to manage because of the low load factor. So in this particular area here, what we'll find is that uh, nuclear energy will be competing one-on-one -on -one with solar power. And uh, uh, we're going to have some difficulties integrating these two parts together. Now, nuclear energy can load follow, but it comes at a cost. 
And if I show you this graph here, if I look at um, capacity factor, uh, capacity factor being the, um, the average output compared to the peak output of the um, nuclear generators, if I go to the low cost curve, which is the nth of a kind curve, you can see the uh, uh, cost up here at about uh, $76 a megawatt hour at a 60% capacity factor, but the cost dropping significantly down here to uh, $60 per megawatt hour as we get to the high capacity factors. Um, with the high cost curve, this curve here represents the cost for the first nuclear power station to be built. So capacity factor is a very important parameter in making uh, the best and most economic use of the nuclear power stations. If we're going to work toward the most economic nuclear system combined with renewables and other generation sources, it might look like this. Now, this system is a 76% nuclear option uh, and it mirrors what's happening in, um, in France. This is the type of level of nuclear output they have in France. Solar has a role. Solar can be, is very good for picking up the peaks in the middle of the day. Its most optimum level comes when the solar energy comes down toward the nuclear and just goes a little bit into the nuclear space, but not too far down. This allows the nuclear power station to the power stations to operate at high capacity factors and produces a very efficient system overall. If we look in more detail, this is how the nuclear system looks over a short period of time. We're just looking at three days. So this is our nuclear space down here, our nuclear generation in action. We can see hydro working through here or in the dark blue, coming in and out, coming in in the middle of the day before the sun comes up, working afterwards when the sun goes down in the afternoon. We've got our solar create util being utilised very well in the middle of the day, providing um, power for this toward the peak during the day, grid solar here, rooftop solar over here. And that part above the black line from here through to the top is energy going into storage, which is then taken out of storage when the sun goes down in the afternoon. So this is, this is the type of system that could produce really good outcomes, I think, for Australia. If we go and look at the costs of these schemes, um, what we've got here is um, the blue line here represents the cost for the output at the generation terminals for various schemes. The grey line here represents the cost to high voltage customers. So there's a transmission uh, and sub-transmission cost involved in getting from this point here. And the top of the line here represents the cost of getting it to low voltage customers like uh, mums and dads and small business. This, rep this picks up the distribution cost through the medium voltage and low voltage system. Also on this graph, we've got the carbon intensity of the various schemes. So if we look, if I just go through and look at cost to small customers, to low voltage customers, at present, we're looking somewhere around the 25, 26 cents per kilowatt hour. This is the output of our modeling with 693 grams per uh, kilowatt hour. If we go to a 100% renewable scheme with pump storage, we find the costs go very high, up to 42 cents per kilowatt hour. And But still, uh, 24 grams per kilowatt hour is a, a good environmental outcome, but coming at very high cost. And if we look at some of the AEMO plans, this is the step change plan for 2042. We're looking at 99 grams per kilowatt hour and a cost of 38 cents a kilowatt hour. For the central plan, we're looking at 348 grams per kilowatt hour and um, about 29 cents a kilowatt hour. But if we go toward the nuclear, the nuclear 50% with 50% renewables sitting at 44 grams per kilowatt hour 
and a cost of about 27 cents. But the one that's head and shoulders above the rest is the 76% nuclear, topped up with renewable energy, but with a uh, 22 gram per kilowatt hour emissions level. So you can see nuclear energy has got a lot to offer, and this is coming through in the modelling that we've been uh, undertaking. So what would we build and why? At this particular point, I'm going to hand back to Rob, who's going to take us through the next part of the presentation. OK, so thank you for that presentation, Robert, on that model you've created, which is, as I say, it's the vital link in understanding the economics of renewables and nuclear and how Australia achieves a low carbon future. So now I'm going to talk about what we would build and why, because we've seen why nuclear can actually do the business. And the future of nuclear energy in Australia is in our hands. We've got to get out of this mindset of going down to the wharf and waiting for the next boatload of magic to come from overseas. We can take charge of this situation. We can go out to the vendors of nuclear power plants, just as the Koreans did, just as the French did, and the Swedes, and we can drive the rate at which new nuclear innovation comes to our country. We saw that happen recently in the United Arab Emirates with the Koreans who built 5.6 gigawatts in four nuclear power plants in very fast time for that country. We saw in the model that Robert's just gone through that the lowest option, the lowest cost option of 76 percent of our energy coming out of nuclear energy requires 24 gigawatts of installed nuclear power capacity. Now that, if we went for small nuclear power plants, some people are calling them SMRs, that would require 80 number of plants. There wouldn't be in 80 locations, they would of course be combined into groups at the nodal points of the grid. In those regions, where we've got the cooling and the transport and the population to deploy. The availability of small nuclear power plants is expected sometime after 2028. However, we need not sit around and wait and planning and options evaluations can take place immediately. And the options could certainly include large nuclear power plants. 10, for example, 1.1 gigawatt or 1100 megawatt nuclear power plants in the near term could actually be constructed and 13 gigawatts of small nuclear power plants as and when they become available. We have the options and the large power plants are an option, especially in Victoria and New South Wales. We'd probably need to reinforce the links between the two states if we went down that route. A better low cost solution for Australia may well be around small nuclear power plants, these 300 megawatt size. That's because the Australian grid is probably one of the longest grids in the world, but it's essentially quite light. We don't have great strength in the grid, apart from in the connections between the Latrobe through to Melbourne or in the Hunter through to Sydney. In this view, we see a typical uh, a small nuclear power plant. This, in this case, it's General Electric's BWX 300. Unlike the large plants we're used to, there are no big cooling towers. Out the back there, you've got some forced vent ventilation coolers. Off to the left, you've got backup water supply. There in the middle, you've got a low rise building with the turbine set sitting in that low rise building and the nuclear island, which two thirds of it is actually built into the ground. And off to the right over here, we've got the switch yard. So it's a very low rise, compact looking system. And here is what a plant would look like on a coastal location. In this case, you'd be getting one through cooling using seawater. And you can see it's a very low rise building about the height of the transmission towers each side of it. This particular plant happens to be a boiling water reactor. It's the simplest way to make steam. The direct cycle design 
requires no steam pressurizers or steam generators. Basically, you've just got water, cooling water flowing into the reactor, <clears throat> into the reactor control of um, reactor unit itself. The steam is generated and flows back out along this line through the turbine. So you've got that's your what we call your primary coolant circuit. Here we have the cooling tower, or it could be first pass water coming from, from the sea that provides the cooling medium. The water in the primary circuit, in this circuit, also acts as what we call a moderator. It is essential to slowing down the neutrons to enable the nuclear reaction to take place in an environment where we're using low enriched uranium. That's three to five percent uranium two three five. Interestingly, in this BWX300, it is also a very tall reactor. It's 29 metres high in the reactor pressure vessel. And that means that there is a significant thermal gradient <clears throat> through this plant. And so there is no requirement actually in this plant for pumps to pump the water. A thermal gradient provides all the hydraulic drive needed to create the primary circuit flow. In this view, we see a we see the actual plant. On the left hand side, this is our steam this is our turbine building here. Here we've got some fuel waiting to go into the nuclear island, which is sitting here. Here we have the administration and controls. This silo sitting in the front, that's our what we call nuclear island. This is the reactor, the reactor pressure vessel sitting in here and we have cooling water sitting up on here and a polar crane that is used for refueling of the reactor. As you can see this is ground level and about two-thirds of this vessel is actually sitting within the ground. The reactor itself is well below ground level. This plant being designed by General Electric, <clears throat> they're looking at putting it into the market in the United States for $2,500 per kilowatt. And we're used to hearing figures for large nuclear plants up around the six and seven thousand dollars per kilowatt. So they are really chasing this market to compete head on with gas and renewables. We've Australianized that number to arrive at a figure of around about 4,580. The reason why it's high is the exchange rate, about 1.4. But in addition to that, there's some enabling infrastructure that we've added into it. And so we get a figure in Australia for each unit of around about 1.37 billion. But for the economic study that Robert went through earlier, we've used a number of 6,767. And that more reflects, shall we say, the first of a kind or the first 10 or so plants for a nation that's trying to get into its straps with nuclear power. In this image, this here is the actual reactor pressure vessel. And sitting within it, we see here, that's the reactor. And down here, we have the control rod drives. Up top here, we have the steam separator and dryer unit that goes off to the turbine. This is known as the 10th generation of boiling water reactors. And it's, it's a scaled down version <clears throat> for the economic simple BWR, which is currently NRC licensed. But it's been de designed very much with a cost, a design to cost approach. And so they've got a significant capital cost reduction per megawatt of capacity compared to even their larger plants. It's capable of load following. And it's also ideal for electricity generation and industrial applications such as hydrogen production or electrolysis um, or producing uh, water for communities. So we can use it for desalination. Its construction is due to, end, to be built first plant probably in Canada um, by Bruce Power at the Darlington site to be operational by 2028.
The safety case of this reactor is impressive, but it's similar to most of the new generation of reactors, be they large or small. They're all looking at what we call these days passive cooling. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, <clears throat> let's take an example of the type of event that the safety case is built around. And it's what we call a locker, a loss of coolant accident. For example, if the main coolant lines going between the reactor through to the turbine were broken, that is a serious event because it's that water that's coming back from the turbine and from the cooling resource that keeps, that removes the, the heat out of the reactor. In, the, in that event, the reactor shuts down. And then what we have is isolating valves automatically open. And so the water that was going off to the turbine, it now flows through this circuit and it comes, the hot water comes out, goes into these condensers, and then it flows back down into the bottom of the reactor pressure vessel. So you get a flow around this circuit. And in that water storage, that's where all the decay heat, the heat that, that caused the unfortunate meltdowns at Fukushima. And so this particular plant is protected against that event by this large water storage. But further, it happens passively. It does not require operator intervention. And unlike at Fukushima, it does not require backup power on the grid to make all of this happen, nor does it actually even require standby generators. This plant is able through a series of actuators and those sorts of devices to enter into this stable um, system for at least seven days. And during that period, this water in this tank can be replenished. We'll now look more closely at the nuclear island. <clears throat> this cylinder that's cast into the ground is about 30 metres in diameter. The reactor vessel itself and its, its uh, steam cycle, it's about four metres across and that's about 29 metres in height. So you can see this cylinder, this, this cylinder is up around 40 metres. Fuel handling, that's handled by this polar crane. So when they want to put fuel into the reactor or take it out, they take this dome off and this smaller dome here, these are removed to this location by the polar crane. The fuel rods are then moved up out of the reactor and they're stored over here in the used fuel racks all underwater. And fresh fuel is brought in from this side and placed down inside the reactor. This here is the main steam tubes going off to the turbines. And these here are the tubes that we saw in the last image, which are taking decay heat up into this water in the case of a loss of coolant accident or some other issue. The turbine that we saw previously in those, those earlier slides, they're existing turbines. Most of the gear, almost 90% of the components in this nuclear island are based on designs that are already in option. So we're not, or in operation, I'm sorry. So we're not reinventing the wheel with this reactor. There's surety in the supply of the equipment. As I said earlier, the first of these plants is due to be built in Canada. And PricewaterhouseCoopers has done a very extensive economic evaluation for what it would mean to the Canadian economy and the Ontario economy in particular. We know from their study <clears throat> that the first up capital cost of the first of a kind is about 2 billion Canadian. And given our exchange rate is about $1 Canadian is about a dollar and five cents Australian. It's a similar order in Australia. The first reactor is due to take seven years to construct and there'll be about 1,700 jobs over those seven years. And as the numbers in here show, a substantial improvement to the GDP of Ontario and Canada generally. 
The reactor, or the nuclear power plant itself, will sustain about 200 jobs over 60 years. But when we move on to the nth of a kind, or the, new, the next group of nuclear power plants, <clears throat> we see that each of those would take about four years to build and would sustain about 2,000 jobs. So if we were to build these types of plants in Australia, where would we build them and how long would it take? Well, in Australia, we know that for site selection on our grid, we need to use the grid to the maximum extent. That's what Robert's modelling has shown. So we'd site them at the major nodes of the Australian grid. Cooling. <clears throat> is a vital thing, particularly in our dry climate. We don't have a lot of water to play with. So first off, we'd look at once through cooling, possibly through sea using seawater resources. If we were to go to inland locations, such as places like Bayswater or out around Wallaroing, we could look at evaporative cooling using the existing facilities used by coal plants. But if we wanted to even cut back on that amount of water, we can go to a hybrid cooling, which means we only use about 25% of the water that's currently used in uh, normal evaporative cooling. That's using a little bit like a car radiator with water jetted through it. it that's the, the kind of principle involved in hybrid cooling. Or if we really were sapped for water, we could use dry cooling. The other options we've got in Australia, which we don't tend to use very much, but we need to explore, are the use of water coming from our sewerage systems in our major cities. And that's the type of thing that is used in Arizona, for example, to keep their nuclear power plants going. Foundations, these plants would be built on rock. And in Australia, issues around seismicity are not an issue. There's virtually nowhere on the Australian continent where any risk of, new, of, of earthquake could cause any problem to this type of plant. They're, they're vastly stronger structurally than the types of loads that uh, seismicity could induce. For example, things like the Newcastle earthquake or the reason, recent ones in Victoria would not affect these plants. What would happen, of course, is they, they'd close down, but they'd be restarted almost immediately. The plants would have to be close by the initial ones by a port. As I said, they're 29 metres in length and the individual units weigh about 460 tonnes. So for us to get into our straps, we'd probably build the first few near ports. We'd have to ensure our bridge loads and those sorts of things could sustain the loads. And we'd also have a look at road and rail transport. Population is the vital thing. And as Robert mentioned, these are a tremendous benefit for regional Australia because they could revolutionise what happens in those communities. We've got a lot of talent sitting in the La Trobe, a lot sitting in the Upper Hunter, a lot sitting in the Illawarra. All of these locations we could look at for nuclear power plants. So there'd be a tremendous community benefit because nuclear power gives much better wages to the, to the people working in the industry. But unfortunately, we have in Australia a lot of NIMBYs, people who don't want anything built anywhere, anytime, and we need to make sure that we're fairly far distant from those groups. Local risks need to be addressed. We've got airports and fuel terminals. Well, you wouldn't build them near, there, near those things. And you'd also ensure that you didn't have upstream dams or lakes that it could inundate the site. The number of plants in Australia, <clears throat> we've spoken earlier, about 80 of these small plants. So we'd have about 30 in New South Wales, about 18 in Victoria, 28 in Queensland, four in South Australia, and we could go over to the southwestern situation in Western Australia where you could use about six. But there are vastly more sites in Australia that could suitably use these plants. I'm going to come now to an overview of where we could actually use the plants. So where would we build these plants 
in Australia. Or we'll start up in Queensland, <clears throat> up around the Townsville region. We could build about 600 megawatts up there. We've got a very good location around Gladstone, Stanwell, or the Callied group of power plants. That's a very strong part of the Queensland grid. And so what we've got here is the 275,000 uh, volt lines. That's these dark purple colours. And so we could build a group there. Or we could go more closely down around the major load in southeastern Queensland. <clears throat> here we've got the large confluence of all of these 275 transmission lines coming down around to the large water resources that we've got in uh, the southeastern corner. Or we could go out to Tarong, which would be another possible location. If we move on to New South Wales, we could go up to the north of the state around Grafton, or we could come further south and we have sites around here <clears throat> near Liddell or Bayswater. The reason for picking there is, of course, we've got the existing coal plants, we've got the confluence of very large transmission lines and good, trans good transport facilities and a learned, skilled workforce that can be trained up to work on nuclear. Or we can go over to the mid-north coast. And here we can be reliant upon using seawater cooling. We could go to Araring, Vales Point, Munmora, or further south down around Tuggera, where we've got this very strong grid that is all designed to meet the Sydney load and the Newcastle load. We could even look around closer to the load around these sites in orange, and that's closer to the load in Sydney, looking at the Hawkesbury and Nampian region as a, as a potential for cooling. We can go out to the existing plants, <coughs> at uh, Ularawang or Mount Piper, where we've got the cooling resources and again, the 500,000 volt line heading off towards the, uh, towards the major load region. Further south, we could even consider the Illawarra because there is a tremendously well-trained workforce. We've got Lake Illawarra, and again, we've got a good confluence of large capacity transmission that could take that power to the rest of the state. Or for a similar reason, we could go out to places like Maroon and the Southern Tablelands. Again, where we've got a large number of high capacity transmission lines and cooling facilities and good transport resources. Canberra could also sign up to one of these. And we've got <clears throat> the recently constructed dam in Canberra down near the Murrumbidgee and we've got this group of interconnectors, transmission interconnectors that could take the power out of the ACT. We wouldn't like to leave Canberra out of the selection process. Heading off into Victoria are where there are tremendous opportunities. The connection between the Latrobe through to metropolitan Melbourne is probably the most powerful connector in Australia. It can take this part of seven or eight gigawatts of energy. And so we could look at plants at your lawn, or we could go to the old Hazelwood site, or we could go over here to Loyang. So there are a tremendous number of plants that could be built there. We could group them in fours or sixes at these different sites. So you could have plants varies of 1200, 1800 megawatts. We could go to Western Port Bay to the Tyab facility, put about 600 megawatts in there, or over to Port Henry, Point Henry, I should say, or right over to the aluminium smelter we've got sitting here at Portland, where we could probably build 1,200 megawatts, four of these plants. Going further into South Australia, South Australia. <clears throat> has a problem because it's a small population and it's got a light grid. And so in South Australia, and it's also a very dry state. And so up here in the north, we've got Port Augusta is an example of where one could put them. Uh, we've got here Port Perry, further south. <clears throat> we could go down around Pelican Point, 
or down here about uh, around uh, the old oil refinery um, at, uh, at at Port Stanwyck. We also have locations over here inland on the Murray. So there are a number of places, but as I say, we need to be very careful in a state like South Australia over the water resources, which is why you would probably be aiming to use once through seawater cooling. And then finally, we could look over in the West, around Western Australia, and we have a number of locations, similar problem to South Australia, a dry state. So you've got locations to the north of Perth or further down to the south or around here in the region around Blues Water or, Mar or Mergib, where you've got the existing coal-fired plants. So that is a quick overview. There are many sites we could build these plants in Australia, um, but we've got to be cognizant all the time of maximising the use of our existing grid. I'll move now to the rest of our presentation. So we've just had a look at an overview of the types of sites or locations in Australia and the factors that would influence where we would build them. So how long would it take? Well, a lot of people, and nuclear draws a lot of criticism for people for claiming it takes too long to actually build. <clears throat> Individual plants can take a while. And we are seeing that in some locations. But we've also seen, for example, in Japan, <clears throat> the boiling water reactors can be built in 39 months. That's a fact. And the last of the advanced boiling water reactors took that long. And we're seeing them built regularly now by the Koreans, for example, in, in about a five or six year period. What's not, what's really important is how long does the fleet take to build, not the individual reactor. And so if we want to go to what the French achieved, <clears throat> they built 63 gigawatts. That's roughly equal to the entire grid capacity of all of Australia, including Western Australia and all the independent little plants. They built all of that in a 22 year period. And they were building at about 2.8 gigawatts per year. That was the average, but at times they got up to five or six gigawatts per year. <clears throat> the anticipated construction period of the BWX 300 and nth of a kind located size is about 36 to 48 months. And that's the four year period they're looking at in Canada. They'll have 50% less construction material than the older large plants that were built by the French. And so if we consider what has actually been achieved in the past, we look up at these two images. And what we see on the vertical axis, <clears throat> and what we're going to talk about now is not the capacity that's built, but the actual energy that comes out of the plug at a person's home. So this is the kilowatt hours per person per year per capita that is actually available out of the out of the <clears throat> to each individual. And we see, for example, that in Sweden, each year they were able to build an extra 650 kilowatt hours per person per year. France got up to around 580. So this is the actual amount of energy that was available. And in the USA, being a larger population, they got to about 150. Germany was at about 130. And so we've seen here some very fast evolutions of available energy coming out of nuclear fleet programs. If we contrast that over to this side, we see what's happened historically with wind and solar. Here we have for the USA. Germany has pretended it's the world leader but it's down around the 120, 130. Denmark tried to put a lot of wind out, but in actual fact, the delivered energy in Denmark is only about a quarter of what was achieved in France or Sweden. Australia has had a rollout of wind and solar, but we have actually achieved about 100 uh, <clears throat> kilowatt hours per person per year per capita. For Australia to do out this program in 21 years, we'd be sitting there. Quite comparable with France, Sweden, 
Belgium, Finland. And so that's eminently achievable. So in conclusion, what we've learned today from the two Roberts you've just heard from is variable wind and solar generation does not have a track record of achieving deep carbon emissions reductions or providing low cost energy on a system wide basis. In fact, variable renewables drive up the cost of the most expensive part of our energy delivery, namely the transmission and distribution, plus the system services and storage. It's all of those bits. These costs significantly exceed the low cost benefits of wind and solar generators. At high levels of emissions reductions, nuclear energy with variable renewables run into problems. And so a system where nuclear energy provides the dominant source of generation is the least cost option, providing energy at around half the cost of a 100% renewable system. And remember, only you, uranium, can prevent climate change. We'd invite questions to either of us at Nuclear for Climate Australia, at info at nuclearforclimate.com.au, or to Robert Barr at Electric Power Consulting. I'll leave that screen up, and that's the end. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.